Hey everybody, 3.55 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, February 21st, in uh, the year 2019, I'm told. I'm trying this early now, uh, instead of how I've been doing it for a while, which is knocking out a video uh, after I've done a few hours of work or so, um, finding it, that's probably, maybe maybe that's not the best way to do it. Uh, anybody who has had or currently has toddlers uh, know exactly what I'm talking about. And so uh, once mine uh, is up and active, uh, your concentration just goes right out the window. So before I start, I do want to say that um, uh, a recent volunteer had made a suggestion concerning uh, the resources page at the Obery Project website. <clears throat> what I did was um, I put up a document uh, that is uh, concerning the pronunciation of Obery. Here's why. Because in all the other documents I'm going to put up uh, that aren't specifically tools, so the documents on there that are specifically tools would be, for instance, um, the the unedited Strong's list, uh, which is very, 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 very useful for anybody who wants to do serious Bible study. Using that, um, along with, uh, I've already posted uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Genesis in Obrey. Um, but then there's going to be articles too, of course. Uh, the thing is, with, uh, with any of those articles that are going to contain Obrey, uh, it would be a, a big mistake, uh, understanding what I do, not only about uh, the Masoretic, which is uh, thus why the Obrey, uh, but also the uh, the vast majority of English translations have created so much confusion concerning um, not only uh, specific subjects animals uh, cities these descriptions that uh, I believe uh, a, a a mix of both Masoretic Hebrew and uh, the vast majority of English translations have really bred confusion in types of animals, certain animals that are named in the Bible. Uh, I have uh, question whether those are accurate. Um, so, because of that sp specific nouns uh, and proper nouns. Not only names, names are important because, you know, throughout the Bible, uh, people would give their children names uh, in Obrey that had meaning uh, in what was going on when, say, uh, the woman was impregnated or near the birth. Um, uh, all those names are so important. And some of them are changed so much. Uh, and it, it really uh, inhibits uh, one's understanding of the Bible. Also, um, cities uh, and, and other important proper nouns. What I cannot do using Obrey, I cannot simply, just for the sake of ease of reading, transliterate those words into something more palatable for the English reader. So these words must appear uh, in their Obrey form in these articles. So since most people um, don't read or, or know how to pronounce or maybe are not familiar with the Obrey character set, which you could call an alphabet. I prefer a character set. 
<clears throat> I put that document on the website. It's it's up a little bit on the resources page. You'll see it within the text uh, highlighted, uh, Obrey pronunciation. Uh, she suggested that I make a video to go along with that and actually include pronunciations. Um, read the text that I provided on different types of, of words and then pronouncing these words uh, as, as just a tool for you know, um, better understanding, ease of use. Um, so I'll do that. Um, in the meantime, uh, anybody uh, feel free to give me feedback on the the ease of use or lack thereof on any of those documents. And you can contact me through the site. There's on the last page there there is a contact form um, though it is sending it to a, a more archaic email um, as soon as I get a little time to to work on that I'm going to change it to the the Obrey sites email I don't know why that was set up in that way in the first place but I didn't set up the site initially I was going to have uh, the service that hosts um, actually design and maintain the site but um, I didn't think they were they were really doing what I wanted um, so I decided to take over I was trained uh, years ago in the early part of this century uh, in computer-aided graphics at the college level uh, the reason I'm in carpentry is because I did not like the environment um, and I, I wasn't thrilled about the fact that people who were uh, more techy, um, well, to put it bluntly, computer nerds, um, were absolutely dominating that field. And um, more than that, uh, one thing you'll find when you get into the arts, because I've been in various forms of the arts my whole life, is um, there are... Uh, very much closed doors uh, within all segments of the arts. Uh, they are dominated by a certain group and they make sure that many doors are very closed to those who not, are not part of the group, the tribe. So, um, this is why uh, so many people who are so talented find it so difficult to break into uh, certain professions because, and they don't understand it. I would, you know, I I wish they did have that understanding. It's because it is dominated, uh, and the doors are pretty much shut. For this reason, and because. The Obery Project was begun with the intent that it would be a spiritual, cultural restitution um, project. Um, I had to think for a second if restitution was the most appropriate word, but I think so. Uh, potentially, or ostensibly, as it grew, it would incorporate and support the creation by um, spiritually intact um, young creators, uh, mediums like film, music, art, uh, by creators who are not going to echo the perversions of what is currently uh, shoved down our throat. You, you, can't, you can't subscribe to uh, any internet-based uh, movie and, and television uh, service, uh, if you want to call it that. It's a disservice to man. Um, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Amazon Prime. You look at the uh, the movies and shows that they produce, 
and it is uh, absolute junk. Uh, and the uh, the the sub narrative has become the overt narrative uh, against masculinity, uh, against uh, white European Christianity, against uh, common decency, um, against uh, preservation of a people, a race. And don't get me wrong, um, I think all races are important um, because, first off, one thing that's obvious is that Yahweh created the races. So I want them to stay intact, and I mean all of them. So propaganda against any of them does not, to me, seem to be uh, very s s <laughs> very good. I was thinking of the wrong word. So that would be um, that would be one of the things uh, ostensibly that the Obrey project would do. And uh, I would imagine it would have to be. Uh, the young people, because the elders uh, of what they call the greatest generation and, and the boomers, um, they drop the ball. And it is, it is the very select few of them uh, that have kept shining a light for us over the years. Uh, and for those, I'm, I am really grateful. So, all right, uh, today I, we're going to start with alchemy. Uh, and then go into uh, Rosicrucianism, and we might get to Masonry. All of these things, I hope you're noticing, I noticed. And again, the link to the article will always be up on these videos. You can read this yourself. It is eye-opening. I already said yesterday um, that Owens is definitely an LDS apologist, what I find fascinating, too, is that he seems to also be, in, in a way, an apologist for, for all of these occult uh, disciplines. S so strange to read this, too. And to understand the, the awards that it got and uh, its acceptance in, I suppose, the, the Mormon community as a whole. Um, perhaps it is the, 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 the justification that he employs in this of, of Smith and his associations and the, the clear overtones in his work. Um, but I, I don't even, I, I'm not sure that I even understand. Uh, the ease at which something like this is is accepted in 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 a sect that purports to be uh, Bible believing Christianity, you know, I mean, help me out if I'm ignorant here. I don't get it because I don't get it. <clears throat> now, concerning alchemy, alchemy is definitely one of those things like hermeticism that you don't hear a whole lot of about, uh, about what what you do here is is simply just in passing and, and you may hear uh, a bit about hermeticism and perhaps its core philosophical uh, beliefs being that as above so below which uh, I think uh, this author aptly uh, drew parallels back to Kabbalism and Adam Kadman. Interesting thing too about Adam Cadman. Cadman, the word Cadman, it would most definitely, uh, in my mind, um, doing the work on Obrey that I do, Cadman would be, I would think, uh, starting with the root Kadem, uh, meaning East, Katnan, and then add the, the Un, Cadmun, or Cadmani, you can find in the Bible a people called the Cadmani. The the Cadmani, uh, interestingly enough, 
oftentimes will be translated as ancients. Uh, Kadem is the word probably most commonly besides um, probably besides um, Mazra used for east and, and Mazra usually has to be used with Shamash for the uh, the sunrise. Uh, but yes, by far um, Kadem is used for east. You see um, Kadamun would be of the east. Um, the Kadmani uh, would be the Easterners, and interestingly enough, um, I would say by, uh, well, not denotation, um, but definitely has the connotation of being ancients, men who were ancient. Um, now, for me, that um, that recalls what I was talking about yesterday concerning Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and there being a difference between the man created uh, in 2 for a specific purpose and the men we see created in 1, the Kadmoni. I find it interesting that this character that they... Uh, are using as an archetype is called Adam Kedmon. Um, the other thing I think is is interesting. I had to think about this as I was doing some some precursory reading. Is uh, how is it with with us understanding uh, how secretive the tribe can be? How is it that Kabbalah was so so spread out and in ways so well known in so many areas of Europe to where uh, this guy would be able to make a case for Kabbalah's blend with, with Christianity. Um, you know, how are these things made uh, so overt and, and spread so prolifically uh, as to influence so many other um, things like Christianity or, let's say, uh, an, an artistic, philosophical, scientific, uh, universal movement like, like the Renaissance. How are, are they um, proliferated if we know that the tribe can they can keep secrets quite well. Um, is it not purposeful that these occult disciplines were spread so much uh, throughout Christian Europe? <clears throat> it's something to consider. Owens begins his small section on alchemy by writing essential to understanding the themes animating the Kabbalistic Hermetic worldview is a discussion of alchemy. In popular misconception, alchemy is an immature, empirical, and speculative precursor of chemistry, having as its primary concern the transmutation of base metals into gold, i.e. Hudson Hawk. The simplification touches at only the most superficial veneer of alchemy. In stark contrast, current historical and psychological readings of the alchemical tradition suggest it had complex roots delving into the religious or philosophical subsoils of Western culture and aspirations far more subtle than the production of gold. Indeed, the dictum of medieval alchemists themselves avows this fact, and in, in Latin, aurum nostrum no est aurum vulgi, or our gold is not vulgar gold. Now, I'm not 100% sure how to take this next paragraph. He says, 
The historical foundations of alchemy rest in the same early Christian epoch as Gnostic cultural milieu that generated the texts of the Corpus Hermeticum and nurtured the early mystical roots of Kabbalah. As with Gnosticism and Hermeticism after the emergence of Christian orthodoxy, alchemy submerged into the darker subsoil of Western culture until the Middle Ages. In the 12th and 13th centuries, renewed contact with Arabic and Greek alchemical materials, together with a reawakening interest in heterodox classical knowledge, inaugurated a new study of this ancient art, he puts in quotations, and to this study was eventually admixed Kabbalah. No less a figure than Albertus Magnus, from 1193 to 1280, became an adept of alchemy and authored numerous alchemical works. To Thomas Aquinas, the great student of Albertus and the signal theologian of the age, alchemical texts are also attributed, a fact suggesting the philosophical and religious tenor of alchemical thought. For the next 400 years, alchemy ran like Ariadne's thread in a labyrinth of creative vision. As the age of reason dawned, Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, and John Locke would secretly correspond on alchemy's occult mysteries. Newton is now well known to have penned more than a million words on the great art. A century and a half later, its mystery would command Goth's masterwork, Faust, considered by C.G. Jung, quote, the final summit, unquote, of alchemical philosophy in its last creative extensions. So hold the phone a minute. You're telling me that Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, and John Locke were all secretly corresponding on alchemy's occult mysteries. Um, so, just like I said yesterday concerning Hermeticism, and its a uh, blend of science with magic, how it gave birth to certain ideas which today are popularly called science. Uh, it, it's so important to pay attention to the thread uh, running uh, throughout all of these <laughs> occult disciplines uh, that he's talking about and what source uh, they're all leading back to, all right? Isaac Newton, you know, Philosophe Naturalis, Principia Mathematica, uh, along with Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, that's a name, develops calculus. He, uh, it's said he proved Kepler's laws of planetary motion in the aforementioned work. Um, thus solidifying heliocentricity <laughs> as a scientific so-called celestial view. Um, this guy also upheld the doctrine universally held by uh, all of the big names in the Reformation, which is that the papacy is the biblical prophetic antichrist. Um, he was made... He was made the president of the Royal Society in 1703. And that, uh, that group and all the uh, subgroups it spawned and a lot of the, uh, in, in my view, deceptions of the 18th century came from that group and, and groups spawned by that group. Um, and he was the second so-called scientist to be knighted after Sir Francis Bacon, another occultist, known Rosicrucian, by the way. But the other two guys, oh, well, one other thing. Now, this is, from, from what I know, this is rumor. Um, well, he standardized the coinage for the queen at a certain point. I don't know how long uh, he was said to have done that. Okay, there's rumors that he contrived clever methods of passing off base metals 
and or developed ways for the queen to pass off coins with less inherent value than stated, uh, even if by weight. That's a, from, from what I know, that's a rumor. That's all I'm saying. So I don't know. I don't know that that is true or not. Uh, history and Wikipedia looks back on him fondly, and I think that should always be a red flag. Uh, John Locke, he's the most influential Enlightenment thinker, called the father of liberalism, postulated empiricism, which I find interesting because this idea of empiricism, I think, led to uh, later philosophies which would um, which would say that there's no difference uh, in races, uh, that we're all the same, and and this of course is is fundamental in communism. Communism, the the thought they want to do away with borders. They always have. And how do they do away with borders? Well, they'll convince you things like there's no difference. There's no inherent difference in races. So why should there be any borders whatsoever? Why, you know, why shouldn't they absolutely be jammed, forced together, forced to commingle, forced to, um, to copulate with one another? Because there is no difference inherent. You see, when he, when he postulates something like empiricism, that um, that that man is is born in a sense a clean slate, and I know it's it's we're talking about mentality, but but everything about um, man and the various races um, is there is a science, an understanding let's say that can be articulated by scientific methods uh, or at least um, testing to see that that there is a clear difference there is a clear difference and you know in saying that I'm not disparaging any race I'm saying there's a clear difference and it is a good thing to keep the races intact as they are so when you start passing off things like there being no difference if if this is being universal and maybe at his time it wasn't passed off as a universal thing amongst various races but it would at least lay the groundwork for later work essentially he would be uh, somebody supporting uh, the nurture argument um, in its fullness over the nature argument. Um, and then Robert Boyle, uh, probably more the pure scientist of the three, uh, in the sense that at least Boyle's law is practical, provable science. And perhaps that's the most dangerous thing, is that these guys, the three that they mentioned, these guys were all, um, these guys were all involved in theological writings. They had a great deal of influence on theology. These guys who are secretly writing uh, to one another, extolling the, uh, the virtues of alchemy. All having to do with theology, theological writing. Uh, you know, if you, if you look up the, the pictures of these guys, the paintings, uh, they're not pictures. I don't think <laughs> the paintings of these guys uh, pay attention to the hood ornaments on them. Um, okay, I'm you know I'm not going to read the whole thing on alchemy, but I will say concerning his first sentence in the next paragraph, central to alchemy was the declaration of the tabula smaragdina, that which is below is above, that above is also below. Now he does say. Uh, the treasure sought by the alchemist was often termed the philosopher's stone. And he goes on to say the antecedent of Joseph Smith's seer's stone. The pearl of great price, the stone rejected by the builder, the phileus philosophorum. Though the alchemical, tra alchemical transformation was often described as 
transmutation of base metal into gold, and though early alchemists had experimental laboratories and engaged in empirical exploration, the late alchemical literature reveals that ultimately it was the alchemist's own human baseness which sought transmutation into something divine. Thus the alchemist was a necessary agent of creative transmutation, a priest in a hallowed ancient priesthood, the son of the widow, a knower of creation's ancient secret, a digger after hidden treasure. The heart of this transition was tradition was embodied in its ultimate mysteries, the Heros Gamos, and uh, there's a lot of Latin in here. And uh, I don't always pronounce this Latin all that well. Hieros Gamos, or Sacred Wedding. And the Mysterium Conjunctionis. And it's with an I, not a J. And it's so much harder to pronounce with just the I. Conjunctionis. Uh, a mysterious union of opposites. Of opposites. Duality. That eternally wed male to female matter to spirit above to below microcosmos to macrocosmos, humanity to divinity. How much of that do we see in modern evangelical Christianity and various sects that would not consider themselves evangelical Christianity? What do I mean? Well, we have, we have God and Satan. We have uh, our divine calling or base calling. We have heaven and hell. Um, we have continued uh, arguments that are said to have come down uh, to us through the ages, through 2,000 years of history, they say, since him who's called Christ. Um, there is Pelagius versus Augustine, correct? There is... Um, well, then there is uh, Luther uh, versus, um, oh, come on, Erasmus, sorry. So, there, <laughs> there's, there's Republican versus Democrat. Um, and this sort of duality, uh, which is, is so inherent in these occult systems, and it's true, it has bled into uh, nearly everything. Uh, it's absolutely bled into um, Christian thought, dualities, absolutely uh, so predominant in Christian thought, just those dualities that I named. And, uh, and it, just so much paganism uh, within what is uh, popular Christian thought. I mean, there, there can't be a question in, any one, in, in anyone's mind why it is we need to repent and turn back to the ways of Yahweh. Now, it's, it's not only those things, those occult things that have, have bled into Christianity. It's also the, the more common sense things like usury. How it is that, 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 that professed Christians uh, throughout um, throughout the Western world are engaging uh, every day, making themselves uh, quite a profit through the base, disgusting practice of usury. I understand that most don't even most don't even realize that this is a base, disgusting practice that that Yahweh absolutely outlaws amongst brethren. I mean, I can understand why the tribe does it, but the thing is, they've been doing that in countries wherein the so-called nobility were disallowed from doing so, so they allowed them to do this very thing to their own people. It is, of course, our own people that are the problem, okay? Because the law says that when we depart from the ways of Yahweh, the alien, he will raise up far above us to become our masters and our oppressors. The problem is us. The problem is within us. As much as I may talk about the uh, despicable practices of the tribe, uh, 
or various uh, violence against us by various peoples. Know this, that the problem is in us. We cannot look outside of ourselves continually for the problem. If we do that, we're going to miss where the problem actually is. And I get, I get constantly wrapped up in, um, in, in political things because so many things make me so angry because what I know is our people, our people are the problem. Look, look, look at Jeremiah. Uh, in his days before Nebuchadnezzar uh, came and, and sieged Jerusalem. His people were very nationalistic. The tribe of Judah with Benjamin and Levi, they were extremely nationalistic at the time. That was not their problem. They had that part pretty well down at that time. Their problem was them, their sinfulness, their they're departing from the laws and statutes and judgments of Yahweh. That was the problem. Now, his section on the legacy of occult societies, Rosicrucians and Masons, I have to tell you, is fascinating. So, I will probably read a number of quotes from this section. It's so telling. Listen to how telling this first paragraph is. By the 17th century, the creative mix of Kabbalistic, Hermetic, and alchemical religious philosophies had nurtured among important sectors of Europe's intellectual elite broad aspirations for a more general religious reformation, even a restoration of the ancient and true religion. Which one is that? Insightful individuals at the creative edge of the cultural culture judged their times and urgently sought an alternative to the vehement Reformation and Counter-Reformation madness, which would soon bathe Europe in blood. One might easily comprehend how this ancient age would be excited by the mysterious announcement of a noble, secret, and ancient brotherhood calling itself the fraternity of the rose cross summoning the elite of europe to join in a new reformation thus began the rosicrucian enlightenment one thing that you're not able to pick up from this string of occult philosophies and practices that he is listing as he goes is the way in which they overlap. Um, Rosicrucianism was around um, before Isaac Newton is writing his secret letters to Locke and Boyle. There is a, a certain overlap, but the one thing to keep in mind is the a continual rebirth of um, the same old world um, occult practices that, of course, he is um, properly attributing to Kabbalah. Now, the thing that is interesting, of course, is this when he does mention that um, they. <laughs> They urgently sought an alternative to the vehement Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Now, keep in mind, he's saying that this is in the 17th century. Now, a lot of things happened in the 17th century, and specifically in England uh, and other places. But I always think of England when I think of the 17th century because of uh, all the things that happened, and most specifically, the removal of the current king and the takeover of Puritan Oliver Cromwell, who, by the way, was very friendly with the tribe, um, and his installment of the new model army. Keep something in mind, by the way, this new model army was the first army of England to don the red coats. And boy, oh boy, 
would we be wise to pay attention to red throughout history and what movements have always donned the red garb um, and been labeled as red and who it was that was first named red and his country red because this all works together history is working together to try to show us that everything in the Bible is coming to pass in our day and age if we simply know what to look for. The thing that I find telling, and again, with Cromwell's uh, New Model Army, uh, the, you talk about a, a bloodbath. That right there was a, a textbook example of the Hegelian dialectic, which of course would not be attributed to Hegel for a hundred or more years, but I don't think Hegel made it up. I think Hegel just articulated um, a system of controlling people that to this day works like a charm. Pretty unbelievable. So we see that happening in Cromwell's time, don't we? Now, uh, one blogger wrote, and it's, it's very insightful, when a manipulative group intends to achieve an objective on a large scale, and they know the general public will admittedly resist the change, the manipulative party will employ a series of social mechanisms. We may refer to this procedure as problem-reaction-solution, an aspect of what is known as the Hegelian dialect or dialectic. This method can be easily recognized by its attributes. Consider the Reformation. And consider all of the denominations spawned from the Reformation. The Reformation, for anything I suppose someone could say about the Catholic Church in that time, and it seems to me that depending on how much we can trust of history and historical texts. And you have to remember one thing, folks, when we're looking at history and we're trying to wonder what things can we trust from history, um, is that it, it is an absolute core communist methodology to destroy uh, a people's history and culture. So I don't mean that that implies that we should view all of the popular history that we have as correct. Obviously we cannot do that. But we're going to have to discern what portions of history seem far more likely based on what we understand going on in our own time and what seem not as likely. It's not necessarily going to be an easy thing. But the, the thing is, you know, the Catholic Church had universally outlawed usury. Banks could not employ usury. You see, it wasn't until guys like um, the, the great John Calvin who said that, well, a little usury is okay, right? And destroyed, destroyed great civilizations. But again, it seems that there was a, a lot of a departure from righteousness. Uh, before these destructive practices were put in place, because I doubt they would have had much luck without that precursory uh, lack of righteousness in general. Look at the, the time of uh, one of the last kings of Judah. Um, his name is often transliterated as Joash, or no, Josiah, not Joash, Josiah. 
uh, Josiah waged a campaign, not only in Judah, but he went into various tribal portions outside of Judah, and he destroyed the high places. That's why you can't find them anymore. You can find them still in what were the old pagan kingdoms. They're still standing to this day. And you know where I mean. But in the territory that was occupied by Israel, those things were all destroyed. Now, do their foundations still exist? Uh, maybe in some areas they do. I don't know whether or not he destroyed their foundations too. But nobody had ever waged a campaign of destroying the pagan high places, of killing the pagan priests, of absolutely cleansing the whole land of anything that had to do with worship of any uh, pagan god than Josiah. But the thing is, the people's hearts were evil, and they had turned away from Yahweh long before. Um, and you know, when a king arose, such as Manasseh and his reign so many years, and the people's hearts so turning away from Yahweh and turning towards the pagan practices of the people that they erroneously allowed to stay in the land under tribute, and he told them not to do that because they would go a whoring after their gods, which is precisely what they did. Because of all of those years and because of the darkness of the people's hearts, Josiah, with as much of a great effort as he made, died at the age of 39 when he foolishly thought to go and war against Peroa Naku in Magdu, not Megiddo which, funny enough, was near Parath, which we know that the so-called Megiddo in Palestine is nowhere near the Euphrates River. But that's another story. Now, some of this stuff is just fascinating, and I think it needs to be integrated into our understanding of history and occult movements. And, of course, it is going to be instrumental in figuring out Joe Smith and what he was all about and his associations, his background, his philosophies. So, Owens goes on to write that in 1614, remember that's just three years after the authorized King James Version was published. In 1614, the first of the enigmatic documents that would become known as the, quote, Rosicrucian Manifestos, unquote, was published at Cassel, Germany titled The Fama Fraternitatis, or A Discovery of the Fraternity of the Most Noble Order of the Rosy Cross. This strange work was a trumpet call, which was to echo throughout Germany, reverberating thence through Europe. God has revealed to us in the latter days a more perfect knowledge, both of his Son, Jesus Christ, and of nature. He has raised men endued with great wisdom, who might renew all arts and reduce them all to perfection, so that man, quote, might understand his own nobleness, and why he is called microcosmos, and how far this knowledge extendeth into nature. You know, concerning that quote that I just read <clears throat> from Rosicrucian literature, and how the Rosicrucians, and then we saw with at least one um, Hermeticist, of course, they're bringing ideas of Christianity into these occult practices, worldly philosophies. And I have to say at this point, one of the greatest tools that will be used to combat um, this saturation of what should be pure biblical belief and practice is going to be the universal standardization of the language, and it cannot be based on the Masoretic system. It cannot be. 
It is going to have to be based on a system of understanding the language apart from the Masoretic and thus the the proliferation of English translations based on that. And don't get the idea that you can circumvent that by just sticking with translations that are uh, pulling directly from the Septuagint. It's got its own real set of problems. And I, for right now at least, believe that <laughs> the Septuagint, for all of its lore and all of its mythos, and so much of what everybody has to say about it is really just an expression in Greek of the same sort of erroneous thought that we get from Masoretic lexicons and ideas and traditions. And one of the, one of the high aspirations I've had for the Obery project is to produce a translation not only you know uh, being able to produce Obery versions of the manuscripts because one thing you have to keep in mind is that the the the, the standard manuscript that we're working from right now is the BHS Biblia Hebraica Stucadensia and that contains some scribal problems there are in existence various other manuscripts and bits of manuscripts. Um, we're not going to know with a certainty what some of these problems are without that universal understanding of the source language. Um, this is one of the reasons that the Obery Project is so important, that the work continues on it and um, continues at a good pace, at the best pace it possibly can. Um, anyone who has not uh, taken some time to start understanding what I'm doing, uh, and, and what those who will be continually volunteering uh, to help what we're going to be doing, um, Visit the website and keep in mind when you do that it is currently uh, under construction. The, the message that, that you see on there uh, was what was initially put there from a number of writings and ideas that I gave to the hosting service. And unfortunately, like I said, they, they, they did not produce what I, I, I wanted. Um, and maybe part of that is my fault. It is under construction. Continually check back and so that you can that you see the changes. Check the resources page. If you don't understand the resources or how you can use them, uh, send me an email through the contact form. And, and I will do my best to try to communicate that to you. Not everybody is going to perform the kind of in-depth study that some of those tools facilitates. I understand that. Some people will. But bottom line is, if you believe in what I and others are going to be doing with the Obrey Project and with Obrey as a standard uh, language to help us understand what the Bible is in fact saying. Um, support it. Support it. In any way you can, support it. Because it is just that important. And, you know, you can go back <clears throat> and look at a lot of my earlier videos and, and you can see how against um, frivolous uh, ideas I am of a lot of people who, um, in my estimation, w would ask for support without really providing uh, a great amount of profitable truth. And so I'm very confident in saying support it. I couldn't be more confident. Because it is, it is going to be ultimately 
uh, a very powerful tool in fighting so much of the occult influence for one thing and the Hellenistic influence for another thing um, that has invaded our understanding of the message of the Bible for I don't even know how long anymore to be honest with you. What is so intriguing is what comes up here. He says the Fama proceeded to introduce the history of a mysterious individual called C.R. Born in 1378, C.R. was the founding father of the Rosicrucian Order, a man who had labored long, though unrecognized, towards the general reformation now declared. C.R., or Christian Rosenkreutz, as he was subsequently identified, had been an, quote, illuminated man, unquote. As a 16-year-old boy, he had traveled to the East, where, quote, the wise received him, as he himself wit witnesseth, not a stranger, but as one whom they had long expected. They called him by his name and showed him other secrets, unquote, including an important text called only the Book M. The boy became skilled in language and translation, quote, so that the year following he translated the book M into good Latin, which he afterwards brought with him. The book M continued to play an important part in the Rosicrucian mythos as one of its treasures. Of course, a vague outline of the story told by Joseph Smith might here also be discerned. C.R. then traveled across Africa to Spain, hoping well that since he himself had so well and so profitably spent his time in his travel that he learned in Europe would highly rejoice with him. Oh, that the learned, sorry, the learned in Europe would highly rejoice with him and began to rule and order all their studies according to those sound and sure foundations. He therefore conferred with the learned in Spain but it was to them a laughing matter, and being a new thing unto them, they feared that their great name should be lessened if they should now again begin to learn and acknowledge their many years' errors. Uh, <clears throat> the quite interesting thing about this figure, that they talk about being a central figure in Rosicrucianism, is that his name is C.R., and of course they dub him Christian Rosenkreutz. The fascinating thing about that, of course, is um, the Georgia Guidestones. The, uh, the, the story behind the Georgia Guidestones is that a man showed up at uh, a certain granite company um, in this town in Georgia, and he went by the pseudonym R.C. Christian and that this man was actually uh, representing a group that wanted to commission these stones, R.C. Christian, uh, very, very close, very similar to this Christian Rosenkreutz. Now, speaking of Christian, a man by the name of Christian Pinto actually did a film on the Georgia Guidestones, and... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it is my opinion, like with a number of his other films, um, that he he does a, a marvelous job at, again, removing from history uh, a certain people who, if you remove their influence on history, you end up with darkness. You are not enlightened. And unfortunately, uh, his films, which seem to be uh, well-funded and uh, definitely well-produced, seem to be uh, doing just that. So you talk about people that are in these uh, occult orders. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I would absolutely um, identify him as uh, an extraordinarily likely candidate for brotherhood. And you guys just got to hear this. It, it's so bizarre. Rejected 
brother C.R. eventually returned to Germany and quietly established his order among those few men who, quote, through a special revelation, should be received into this fraternity, unquote. Among these men alone were shared and transmitted the secrets of the order. After death, C.R.'s body was concealed in a tomb and eventually forgotten. But this lost vault, declared the Fama, had around the year 1604 been again found, opened, and entered with its miraculously lighted geometric confines, C.R.'s followers discovered an altar, a brass plate, upon which were engraved mysterious words and glyphs, several records of the order, and the book M. And now the Fama continued. Like as our door was after so many years wonderfully discovered, also there shall be opened a door to Europe. When the wall is removed, which already doth begin to appear, and with great desire is expected of many, howbeit we know after a time there will now be a general reformation, both of divine and human things. Our philosophy also is not a new invention, but as Adam, after his fall, hath received it, and as Moses and Solomon used it. Upon close examination, the fama fraternitatis presents itself more as an allegory than as actual history, and this was probably its intent. The Rosicrucian mythos was connected closely with the mis mysteries of alchemy, where allegorical legends of buried treasures, miraculously rediscovered, were particularly prevalent. However, the story was generally interpreted literally, and the excitement it incited grew the following year with the publication of the second Rosicrucian manifesto, the Confessio Fraternitatis. This second manifesto repeated the message of the first interpreting and intensifying it, and added a powerful apocalyptic and prophetic note. A great millennial reformation was at hand, and with it a return to Adamic knowledge revealed by God. From the Confessio it says, We ought therefore here observe well, and make it known unto everyone that God hath certainly and most assuredly concluded to send and grant to the world before her end, which presently thereupon shall ensue, such truth, light, life, and glory as the first man Adam had. So then, the secret hid writings and characters are most necessary for all such things. What before times hath been seen, heard, and smelt, now finally shall be spoken and uttered forth, when the world shall awake out of her heavy and drowsy sleep, and with an open heart, bareheaded and barefoot, shall merrily and joyfully meet the new arising sun. One year later, in 1616, a third and final Rosicrucian document appeared, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. Cast in the form of a long allegory in alchemical symbolism, it bid the wise of Europe approach a sacred royal marriage, the Hierosgamos of mysterious mystical intent. And this from the third document. This day, this day, this, this, the royal wedding is. Art thou thereto by birth inclined, and unto joy of God designed? Then mayest thou to the mountain tend, where on three stately temples stand, and there see all from end to end. The Rosicrucian manifestos caused a fervor throughout Europe and England. Individuals espousing sympathy with Rosicrucian ideas published numerous works lauding the Brotherhood's purposes and petitioning acceptance into the order. But to the dismay of all, the Rosicrucian Brotherhood never declared itself, never accepted or acknowledged the many aspirants to its fellowship, and indeed perhaps never even really, at least outwardly, existed. While history has identified both the author of the manifestos being Johann 
Valentin Andrea and a wider group of individuals sharing the Rosicrucian aspirations, the deeper sources and purposes of the movement remain enshrouded in layers of mystery and supposition. Now, I can't help but draw your attention to the fact that all of this was happening in the early 1600s. And as I mentioned at the start of the reading of this section, something else that was happening in the early 1600s is what is called today the authorized version of the King James Bible. And there were various characters before that time actually producing English versions of the Bible, uh, oftentimes uh, New Testament versions. Uh, were being produced, Bishop's Bible, Matthew's Bible. Now, the King James Bible, actually, it is said they, they basically used older Bibles, like most specifically the Bishop's Bible, to produce their translation. Some people rumor that they were also using the Geneva Bible, which, um, you know, if, if, if a dominant source behind the, uh, the translation of the Geneva Bible was John Calvin, I would call that translation into question. I would certainly call the King James translation into question, not just for technical reasons, although some people have published a great deal on the technical problems with the King James translation. Also the fact that there are rumors um, that, you know, you can take with as many grains of salt as you want, but a few very intelligent writers have produced uh, some documents drawing very, very stark parallels between the King James authorized version and the works of Shakespeare. Yeah, and there are also these societies um, that basically, they're, they're like academic, like little academic societies groups. There was um, the the college I went to for, for graphic design, um, the dean of that college, uh, I don't know why I ended up in his office. It wasn't a bad thing. Was, um, I, I think I was meeting with him about something else, and for some reason we started talking about Shakespeare. Because uh, he had something on his desk, I think, and he started telling me about this uh, society that he was in that believed that Shakespeare was in fact not a man, not an individual, and I mean he gave me so much evidence that these people compile. Um, really interesting guy, to, to be honest, and what they believe uh, is, and this might not be all of them, but definitely the one that he was in, that uh, this individual figure known as William Shakespeare was, was nothing of the sort. It was a group of men and um, uh, most people, including them, you know, they believe that it was led by Francis Bacon, that he was it's really the leading force behind these works of, of William Shakespeare. Um, if you think some, like, countryside English bard knew as much about internal politics as the, uh, the plays that were produced by Shakespeare, that's insane. Now, you can compare the type of English used in Shakespeare, which was so fledgling at its time with the type of English produced in the King James Bible. Again, fledgling language. Now, there's many who would also go a step further and believe that it was, in fact, the Rosicrucians who were responsible for bringing England first and eventually the world and maybe there would be more secret societies involved with this uh, than just them the English language as we know it today which folks the English language is the the is the 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 height of bastards of languages that is what the English language is. It's about 20-something, 20 26, 28% German because uh, it was far more Germanic before these uh, very drastic changes took place. It's about 20-something percent Germanic and then mixed within it are so many portions of what are either called the Romantic languages uh, and and various other European languages that are far more Latin based than Germanic based mixed in 
there's Italian words in it, and there's French words in it, and there's Spanish words in it, and of course there's Latin words in it, and there's Greek words in it. I mean, that's why, for one thing, so many of these Latin, uh, Latin words that I'm, I'm reading in this document, you can recognize on their face. Because there's so many, there's so much Latin, uh, in English. And it has become, uh, I think, and this may have been <laughs> the impetus, the idea behind this, this reimagining of, of English. And um, there's no way that they put that much effort into it w without there being a plan for that to become um, the lingua franca. There were ideas that definitely uh, precipitated this. And don't think that at this time there weren't absolutely brilliant linguists and, and that there was in some way um, uh, any kinds of... Uh, uh, real barriers to the same people coming up with the same types of plans using similar types of people then as they do now. They're just continuing, they're just gaining ground. That's all that's been happening. English as a language is like the, the, it, it, it's sort of the, the most fertile soil for a sophist and a lawyer to work their magic. And uh, I'm not being euphemistic when I say magic. Um, there is nothing organic or accidental about the English language. And it would seem by a great deal of, I would say, both circumstantial and relatively hard evidence that we can thank the Rosicrucians for this. And when you see the the ties that uh, Owens uh, attributes to um, Kabbalah and Hermeticism in Rosicrucianism, uh, you'll see again this common thread throughout all of them, this common occult thread throughout all of them. And again, I can't emphasize enough, what is something that we, we know how well the tribe can keep their secrets? How is it that it was so darn proliferated? Yeah, I mean, he goes on to say that this was a new slash old religious vision steeped in hermetic, cabalistic, alchemical, and in the broader definition, Gnostic symbolism, a mythos that had been brewing in the pregnant retort of European creativity for over two prior centuries. The tradition's doctrines, imbued as they were with an experimental, experiential, creative, and immensely personal vision, found expression in a peculiar, symbolic, or hieroglyphic language. An idiom alchemical in nature, but ever more religious, philosophic, and physical chemical in intent. So he is definitely uh, attributing to them oh, a lot of what we see symbolically uh, that we would attribute to the occult, that we would attribute to Masons, that we would attribute to the Illuminati. Uh, whether or not they still exist as something independent uh, of other, um, I think, uh, other more secret, stronger organizations, whether or not anything like the Illuminati still exists, independent of that, I think is up for argument. But the fact that they, that, that they are so involved with uh, a language of symbols, and these people by then had a, I think, a very strong, um, occult system of language and understanding of the old practices, the very practices disallowed, even outlawed by Yahweh in his law. He says, in 
and interwoven in all was a new working of the old sacred mystery of Kabbalah. This infusion of Kabbalah was aided in the later 17th century by Nor and Rosenroth's translation into Latin of several key Kabbalistic works, including large sections of the Zohar. Now, Jiminy Christmas, does this guy go into a lot of works produced, uh, attributed at least that he and maybe some other authors would attribute to Rosicrucian uh, authors around this time. Something a little bit more interesting, though, uh, a little later on, he says, writes, by the late 17th century, several occult hermetic brotherhoods, including Masonic and Rosicrucian societies, existed in England. The relationship these fraternities had to the first Grand Masonic Lodge organized at London in 1717 remains unclear. Although noting that, quote, Masonry underwent gradual changes throughout a period of years stretching from well before 1717 to well after that date, unquote, modern authorities on Masonic history usually mark the beginnings of, quote, speculative Masonry to the decade following organization of the first Grand Lodge. Not long after this, around 1750, a specifically Rosicrucian order had been incorporated into French Masonry. Within the initiatory structure of the occult lodges, allegorical mystery plays were used to convey through symbolic ritual the grounding mythos of masonry, a mythos which appears to have been fundamentally hermetic slash Kabbalistic. Yeah, and let me tell you something, that is not limited to that day and age, the mid-1700s. Um, and the, the sort of uh, uncomfortable thing is that they're still doing the same thing, these mystery plays, except they're just encoding them into movies and music and television. It's just disgusting. I mean, besides the fact that it has to be, you know, all of it has to be so now overtly pornographic, you know, pe uh, people can't even see something that that's claimed to be historic, like Schindler's List, which is a a, a load of manure, uh, without being exposed to tons of pornography. So it's bad enough that 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 has become so accepted and so overt. But these mystery plays concerning the occult and all this occult symbolism is absolutely just as overt to this day, which again would be one of the uh, one of the later aspirations of the Obrey project to support those kinds of things those endeavors the power of the medium of uh, of film and music it's it it can't be understated he goes on and says through several renditions of masonic history though they still emphasize the role of earlier craft guilds as a source of freemasonry Relatively little evidence supports this claim, though. That's, that's really important. <laughs> that he just, and I, I stepped on it. I, I messed that up. But that's, ah, that's important right there. Think about that. He says the several renditions of Masonic history still emphasize the role of earlier craft guilds. They all do. They all say it comes from craft guilds. They all say it comes from guarding the secrets of craft guilds. And I don't believe that. I never have. He says, though, though they always say that from these early traditions of craft guilds, the source of Freemasonry, relatively little evidence supports this claim. Correct. Now, I've got, I've got my own reason for absolutely believing that to be the case, and here's why. Craft guilds. So we're talking about, like, because they will. They will draw this back to, let's say, the people that built the great cathedrals of Europe for one thing. And they'll say that the, these craft guilds would guard their secrets so much uh, that, in a sense, it gave birth to this secret order. Bull crap. Craft guilds, any sort of craft guild, if you wanted to learn this craft guild, the skills, you would apprentice with them. And you could apprentice with them. And you could learn the skills that they had. 
No, 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 no. They, they, they don't have a reason for keeping their craft a secret, although they may guard their craft. There's nothing wrong with that, and only teach it to those who put in the work, like the apprentice in, a, in any kind of craft. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing uh, secretive in the way that damagingly secretive. The only people that have a, 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 a real strong reason to keep things secret are those who do damage to others. And that's precisely where this tradition comes from. Even if one grants the existence of some linkage of 18th century masonry with earlier craft guilds, this does not diminish the molding force Hermeticism, alchemy, and Rosicrucianism had on the fraternity's symbolic and philosophic development. Um, I find that to be extraordinarily fair on his part. Again, I don't believe for a second that this is spawned from, from honest, talented craft guilds whatsoever. Sorry. Um, simply put, 18th century masonry was forcefully shaped by esoteric, hermetic, cabalistic traditions. While emphasizing this, I allow that several Masonic lodges eventually evolved with less esoteric underpinnings and much simple, fraternal intentions. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the thing. And that's, that's many of the lodges today. Um, people that would tell you they're in a Masonic lodge. You know, of course, we hear so much about masonry that is, um, I guess, that is far different than what the average mason at the local lodge experiences. Because what they typically tend to experience is something that's more like, uh, you know, uh, ci civic uh, sort of service and stuff. Or they, they, act they might donate to the local uh, arts center or something uh, for them to do some uh, some some renovations of course uh, they'll want to make sure that one of their local brothers uh, does the work of course of course um, however that that's usually what the experience is for the local mason now that does not clear them of responsibility for what the higher masons do it does not clear them of responsibility. They're paying dues. That money is going somewhere that they raise or that they bring in through dues. It's going somewhere. It's doing something. Is that thing good for anybody who is involved with local Freemasonry? And you see it as just that kind of thing. Well, you know, it's a place where I can actually, I can make business connections. Yeah, I pay dues. You know what? My lodge, we, we barely even do those, those certain, you know, we do some of those, uh, uh, those rituals. They're, they're really just, they're nothing. They have some, some basic, you know, symbols to them and we can tell you about them. And that's what, that's our public face. Whether they know it or not, that's just public face. And all they are, they're, they're a bunch of goyim paying in their money and supporting men at the top of these orders of goyim doing evil things to them and others they don't care about them you know they let you in you're gonna pay your dues yeah why is it there is a why is it there is an overwhelming amount of cops that are uh recruited for Freemasonry. It's become, it's become so d predominant that the police themselves are essentially becoming a secret society. Do you think that that is healthy? It's not. And that is the other reason you should take as a clue that Yahweh is not going to allow these changes that people, so many people now desperately want to see taken place. He's not going to allow it to take place in any kind of secular matter. 
This is going to have to be his people returning to him. He's not going to allow these changes to happen again in a secular way. We tried it and tried it and tried it and tried it and tried it in the past. It doesn't work. He's not going to allow it. The reason it doesn't work is because that's man's way. We have to return to his way. He's not going to allow these secular solutions to fly. It's not going to happen. You know, it's the same thing with National Socialist Germany. They had a great idea, and, and they tried very hard. They, you know, National Socialism is a brilliant uh, economic political system, social system, absolutely brilliant. And they, they pulled Germany out of uh, its, its, its languishing um, poverty and starvation imposed upon them by the Treaty of Versailles, by the tribe behind the Treaty of Versailles from being stabbed in the back in World War I and all the, the unfair reparations. Um, but remember, don't you keep this in mind, it was a secular plan. It was a secular political plan, so it failed. He's not going to allow us to solve our problems through secular politics. I don't care how good a system or idea it is. Now, uh, Owens goes on to say some, uh, write something that I, I think is, uh, again, really great information concerning Masonry. Taking note of the increasing influence of Freemasonry in politics and society, German historians began attempting, during the latter part of the 18th century, to trace the historical roots of Masonry. Evidence compiled during this period suggested those roots led not to King Solomon or the craft guilds, but to... Rosicrucianism. This view was in wide circulation by the early 19th century, and in 1824 the prominent English essayist Thomas de Quincey published and detailed the restatement in London Magazine. While A. E. Waite rejected this assertion in 1887, Francis Yates recently restated a strong case for it. Quote, the European phenomenon of Freemasonry she concluded in 1972, almost certainly was connected with the Rosicrucian movement. Whatever judgment one favors, it remains clear that during the period of Joseph Smith's life, Masonry was not uncommonly believed to be associated with Rosicrucian legacy of alchemical, Kabbalistic, and hermetic lore, and its reformative religious aspirations. You know, we're, we're just seeing, in a sense, um, one ugly child spawned from ugly parents in this, this string of, of one thing to the next, from Kabbalah to the infestation of what was then the expression of Christianity in Europe, Catholicism. Uh, and to the various expressions of the Reformation, which I don't see as pure biblical practice either, uh, to Hermeticism, to alchemy, to Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. And remember, if, if Rosicrucianism has become more of a background thing now, uh, and Freemasonry far more at the forefront. And you keep in mind that, as he just stated, um, it's absolutely clear to those who have looked into it that the origin of their order is not Solomon, it is Rosicrucianism. So, in other words, modern Masonry, which definitely seems to be the most prolific uh, form of these occult expressions uh, by the Goyim, mostly. Although, yes, there are many uh, from the tribe that are involved in masonry. They, they really, they just run masonry from a bit more of a secret perch. However, the masons definitely bear the responsibility of carrying that torch of all of the deceptions, the uh, erroneous occult philosophies and misdeeds of all of those occult disciplines to come before them. 
And on that note, I'm going to wrap this video up. So coming up next is Hermeticism and the Magic Worldview. And we are getting so close to our target um, of what I'm telling you. It's, it's going to be very enlightening. So uh, stick with it, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video.